Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Seedling Stage Knitting Podcast. My name is Athena, and I'm a new knitter since last year September. So uh, it's a little bit over six years since a little bit over six months since I learned to knit. And this is just a little space in the internet where I share my knitting adventure with you. So uh, welcome to the second episode. So uh, if you haven't looked at my first episode, I chatted about how I got into knitting uh, and shared some of my first knitting projects with you. If you're new here, welcome. And if you've already subscribed and just checking out my second episode, uh, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm super, <laughs> I, I was super excited about my first episode. I received, I received a lot of nice, nice comments and encouragements from you. Uh, I feel the knitting com- community is one of the most welcoming, friendly community around the world or around the crafting world. And I'm super excited to see a lot of new beginners that joining in my channel and want to uh, knit with me. And also there's a lot of uh, uh, knitters who've been knitting for 60 years and who also joined my channel. And I'm very thrilled to welcome all kinds of knitter uh, here in this little space. And uh, yeah, I just want to say a big thank you for for all of you. Today, uh, I'll just share some of the new knitting progress about me. And uh, I'd also like to share one uh, Japanese knitting book with you. Um, So before before I got started, uh, there is one thing about knitting that I I forgot to talk about last time. Uh, I'd like to talk about a healthy knitting habit and my knitting styles. So uh, when I first learned knitting, I learned the English style where I'll just grab something. When I first learned knitting, I learned the regular English style where you carry the yarn on your right hand side kind of like this and you flick the yarn around like that. I'm just purling. And this is the way my grandma and my mom did. And this is also my knitting mom, knitting teacher Zoe did. And this felt quite intuitive for me at the beginning. But then later I learned there are different knitting styles. But um, so different knitting styles, they achieve the same result. You achieve the same result of putting new loops into the old loops. Uh, but the the way they do it is a bit different. So later when I was trying to do some fair L color work, so basically I'm going I, I, I needed to put two different colors along a line and uh, and to do that at, at first I just uh, put everything on my right hand side. I use let's say I use this green colored yarn, I do a few stitches. And then I grab another yarn and do another stitch. And I just feel that's a bit too, uh, it's not very efficient in my opinion. And I just, I, I just search through the internet uh, how people do color, color work more uh, efficiently. And I've seen people like holding two strides of yarn and do do things on their right hand side. I couldn't figure out how to do that. And I and I I found there are people who's holding one strand of yarn on the right hand side and doing the English style and another strand of yarn on the left hand side and doing the continental style. And and they just ch- change change different hands when they are changing colors. And that method seems um well, it, it clicked with me and so I basically had to learn continental knitting through that. So that's like putting this yarn on the left hand side and I pick this yarn from the left hand side like so. So I've, I've seen 
of routine knitting pod a uh, knitting podcast uh, described this technique in one of their episodes. Uh, I think in episode 16, I will put a link in below. So I, I think that they demonstrated this method quite clearly. So I don't think I'll, I'll do that again. Um, so basically after that, I picked up continental knitting as well as English style knitting. And as time goes by, I just feel the continental knitting style feels more intuitive to me and easier. And the best thing about continental knitting style is that when you are doing ribbing, uh, you don't need to throw the yarn back and forth like when you do the uh, English style. Like in the English style, when you do a knit stitch, you knit, and then you have to, after you knit, you have to bring the yarn back and uh, do a purl, and then you bring the yarn front and do the purl or do the knit. But if you're doing the continental style, you it's it's very easy for you to just uh, flip the yarn front and back like so. Uh, so I, I ended up doing continental knitting for now. Uh, and I, I would highly recommend any new knitters try both style and see which style sticks more for you and I, I feel continental is a bit more efficient for me but I mean people have uh, different types of ways to use their hands so I don't know for me uh, I always like to use both hands if possible and the English style it, it feels that I've just put more put too much work on my right hand and not enough work on my left hand so I just like to distribute the task evenly on my both hands. Um, so for the continental knitting style, uh, there's also a different variation, and that's the Norwegian knitting. And the Norwegian, uh, the Norwegian style, the knit stitch is, I think, very similar or almost the same as continental knitting, where you just uh, put uh, insert the needle through the loop and pick one stitch from from the yarn on your left hand but uh, their pearl is different in that they just leave the yarn at the back and do a little dance thing like that and uh, there is a demonstration of this style by uh, the Carlos on and Carlos uh, YouTube channel and there's uh, there's also some video from uh, Inga from Knitting Traditions that's demonstrating this style and also I, the first time I saw this was actually in a, in a uh, tutorial uh, in a tutorial from Bedit Knit when I was trying to follow one of her patterns and she had a video of just doing some technique and <laughs> and I, I couldn't identify the knitting stitch and the pearl stitch at that time uh, and later I realized that's actually a pearl stitch where they just do the little dance thing uh, well, I I tried that but I still prefer the continental knitting uh, continental pearl and um, like this I think that's just a bit more efficient for me I feel when I'm trying to do the dance thing, there's just some extra movement for me. Um, so yeah, so finally I sticked with the continental knit and the continental pearl style just for doing general stock net stitch. And if I'm doing color work, I will use oh, both hands, one for the English style and one for the continental style. Um, so. Yeah, so I think it's nice to sample around different knitting styles. I've also seen um, some people like putting their yarn around the neck and picking stitch from the from the yarn from the neck. I'm not sure what style that was, but that seemed really cool. And I might <laughs> I might do some research on it later and and try to see if that work if that works for me. Um, Anyway, so that's for the knitting styles. And another small topic I want to chat about is 
um, healthy knitting styles and ergonomic knitting. I feel that uh, as a new knitter, uh, we just we were just too excited. We we kind of would get very excited about the new knitting techniques, and I would just want to knit every day. And also as new knitters, we are not as fast as. Of people who've been knitting for years, and we would really want to get good results. So we just put a lot of hours trying to trying to knit. But sometimes our movement are not the most、uh, good for our hands, are not the most healthy, and that may cause some、uh, injury. And I, w- I was almost there for a couple of times, and I, I just want to say how I avoided those things before I got too injured. And also, I saw that、uh, Broga from the Wooly Witch,、uh, Wooly Witch Craft podcast、uh, was posting some picture on her Instagram where she seriously got the wrist injured just due to knitting, and that kind of、um, saddens me. It's just so.、Uh, It's so sad. So, so I want to talk about this, so that people won't get hurt from, or、uh, get injured from doing knitting too much. So,、uh, let's see. So there are a couple of things we have to pay attention.、Um, so one thing is the wrist joint. You would want to keep it in a good position, and、um, so our wrists are, are built in a way that if.、Uh, The hands are facing each other. It's more healthy, and if we move around like this, it's better. But our wrists are not built to handle this kind of motion where we do this, and that's that's kind of why when people are using the mouse, th- there are like ergonomical m- mouse that allows you to move the mouse like this instead of like this. And this is the same、uh, principle as for knitting.、Uh, so when we are knitting, it's better that we avoid doing things. I feel that when I'm getting very excited about knitting and I just want to like do really really fast, my hands t- just kind goes to this position, and and like do this kind of motion a lot. And there was one night where I would just. Wasn't too mindful and did a lot of this motion, and by the by the by the night I have felt some like joint、uh, joint pain around here, and I had to stop. So so we have to be careful when we're knitting. Uh, we may um we put our two hands facing each uh facing each other as much as possible. Like we can knit like this. Oh, like that. Oh, I <laughs> I can't knit with my hand holding my hands up here. <laughs> so, so pay attention that you put your wrist in the optimal position, and don't do this. Especially, I think in the knit stitch, people tends to do do this more. So, uh, be careful about the wrist. And another thing is the ang- the knuckles. Um, I I realized a couple of days ago that、uh, the other day I was working in a project where it was quite tight with the larger needle, and I just pressed my left thumb. Let's see if you can see. I pressed my thumb like this with the knuckle、uh, locked,、uh, because when I was just Like pushing it, and I was just pressing it with my knuckle bent back like that, and after a while, I just feel again some pain around the knuckle, and I I just realize that's really bad. And for a good position of the knuckle is that you don't lock it like this. You you keep it bent like this when you are pushing the needle. So let's see if we can see. So when when you are pressing the needle, make sure you keep the knuckle a slightly bent around like that. It's kind of the same when、uh, when I'm doing yoga, and my yoga teacher keeps telling me don't bend your、uh, don't 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 lock 
your elbow don't lock your uh, your your knee and you keep it slightly bent and I think that's the same principle uh, I mean, knitting is just finger yoga, right? So if we're doing finger yoga, we have to pay attention to the same thing. So um, keep, when you're pressing the needles with either hand, make sure you don't uh, bend your, uh, lock your knuckle back like that and keep it a little bit bent like this when you're pushing the needle. Uh, and a last thing, uh, a last place where people might get injured or at least I was almost injured is uh, the uh, little finger uh, when I was just over clutching the needles. So when I first switched from English to English style to continental style, uh, basically I changed the yarn to the left uh, to the left hand side and then there there was no yarn on the right hand side and my my little finger, perhaps it just feels a little bit of lack of tension and I might have overcompensated it by just holding the needle, clutching the needle really, really hard. And especially when I'm knitting with uh, thinner, smaller needles, there's not a lot, a lot of volume for me to uh, clutch upon and, and I just clutch my little finger uh, in the in the thin air like this and after a longer time it just got really painful um, and and I try to correct my like death grip and one method I thought about was to uh, was to make a ring type of thing so this is just some cloth uh, or some, some goth or you can you can just find some cotton cotton uh, cloth or something and then I uh, I stick them together with a piece of a bandit and you can also stick together with any kind of tape and then I just make a, a, a soft ring out of them and I put my little finger inside like this so that later when I'm knitting, my little finger won't just be over clutching and it will just be uh, landing on this soft goth here. It, and I, this kind of worked as a correction tool. Uh, I got this idea because I was searching for little finger pain when knitting on the internet and I saw people uh, they have some sort of uh, little ring, little finger ring with like metal kind of thing. And well, I, I don't have those kind of ring, but I just made this and uh, it worked for me. So after I, uh, I knit with this thing on for a while, uh, my little finger kind of just get relaxed and and now I don't even need this. Uh, then I can automatically relax my little finger. So if um, if that's some issue that have occurred to you, I hope that might be useful for you. One more thing before I go on. Um, I had a small correction to make from episode one. Um, last time I presented my uh, knitted uh, animal doll, this little sloth uh, that I made. And it was from a book called Knitted Animal Friends and I adapted an owl animal doll uh, pattern into this sloth and I said that uh, it was just weird because the owl doesn't have long legs uh, but sloth has long legs so I should make a sloth instead of an owl. Uh, but then uh, later I learned that the owl, they actually have super long legs and I'll put a picture here. <laughs> it's kind of amazing. Their long leg was uh, hidden all below their feather. So normally people don't see, but they do have long legs. So uh, the original owl design in the book makes sense. So pe people should make the owl, but they, people can also make the sloth as well. <laughs> they are both cute.
So now I'll present my finished objects and voila! Here it is my uh, cardigan number eight. I just finished uh, minutes ago before I'm starting to record this because I, I just feel I, I, I must finish this before I record this episode and I worked really, really hard. This cardigan number eight is a uh, design by my favorite knitwear. Uh, and this is, uh, I, I think I showed the yarn last time when I was still working on the front piece. Um, I knitted the medium size and it's kind of an oversized fit for me. Uh, I haven't blocked it, I just finished it freshly out of the needle. Uh, this cardigan features some uh, features this button band and I haven't put in the buttons yet and this cardigan also has uh, some pockets and I will just uh, put the pockets here after uh, after I finished recording and then I'll do all the blocking thing. Um, the original pattern calls for uh, some Isagern uh, Aran tweed yarn but I don't have them and they are quite <laughs> expensive so I looked for some uh, some more affordable options uh, and I found host garn uh, from uh, from Denmark and I uh, I hold uh, I, I hold four strands of host garn yarn together so I I had uh, two strands of their super super uh, super soft yarn which is 100% wool uh, fingering weight and then one strand of their ties uh, line yarn which is a uh, silk and wool blend and then another strand of uh, alpaca fingering weight yarn and I, I think I bought uh, 200 gram of each type of yarn or so something like that I put all the details in my Ravelry so if you're interested you can uh, check the link to my Ravelry um, and the and I I did some serious calculation of how much yarn I need I needed and it turns out that my calculation was perfectly on point and this is how much is left from from all from finishing the project so just I think these are a little bit left for the super soft wool yarn and there there's a little bit more of this alpaca yarn left because this is a super super thin super super thin yarn and I'm, re <laughs> I'm really happy with my calculation um, back to what I learned from doing this project this is my second sweater uh, second piece of garment and my first piece of cardigan and I think this is a quite a beginner friendly uh, project for a cardigan because it's just mainly a uh, stock net stitch and some uh, sing single ribs and uh, I think the most difficult par part perhaps is the uh, is the button band where it is using a double knit technique so double knit is uh, you can see the back and the front they are both in a uh, stock net stitch and when you're doing it you're actually uh, let's say, say you see five stitches per row here but actually when you're casting on you're casting on 11 stitches and you knit the first stitch and you slip the second stitch purlwise you knit another stitch and then you slip another stitch purlwise and and you knit through and then when you turn back you you uh, knit the stitch and slip the purl purlwise knit a stitch and slip one purlwise so you kind of end, end up with uh, having this double layered fabric like if you can see it's it's kind of uh, it's 
empty in between, and you can even stuff some things between. And you can hide any yarn, uh, hide any like these leftover yarns in the in the in the uh, in between these pieces if you want. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something new I learned for doing this button band. Um, so in this. In this pattern, the uh, the designer didn't give you very clear instruction on how to do that, and I had to. It just ask you to search for double knit button button band on the internet. Uh, uh, but uh, luckily, I found that in uh, a uh, petite knit, uh, she has uh, another cardigan called the champagne cardigan. And that cardigan has a same, a, a similar, a very similar uh, double knit button band design. And Petite Knit has some tutorial video on her website on this uh, champagne cardigan website. So I just uh, look at Petite Knit's video for doing this button band. Uh, so that's one thing I learned. Uh, another thing I learned was the uh, Italian uh, Italian bind off or the Italian cast off for the single ribs. So if you can see here, um, this is done with the Italian bind off. And with this bind off, you can see it's very stretchy and it preserves the shape of the, uh, of the single rib. Uh, instead of like when you're just doing the regular cast off, these it, it doesn't have this nice kind of edge. It will just be uh, kind of stiff and not as cute. So uh, uh, I, I would say it's a good casting off technique for uh, for the for the single ribs. Um, but it it takes a bit more time. You're uh, the way I learned I, I learned from a knitting book that I have and the way they do it just uh, going through these stitches uh, by using a, using a threading needle um, but I'm not sure uh, I've heard from my knitting teacher that uh, the Western knitting community has a different way of doing it but I learned it from a Chinese knitting book that I have um, so I don't know. I'll, I'll maybe I'll I'll check out some other uh, English knitting videos for how to do this. But oh, yeah, so it's a interesting technique to do. Uh, the construction of this uh, cardigan is quite interesting as well. So it started with the back piece and knitted until like the bottom of the armpit and then it picked up the stitches from this seam line and then knitted towards the front until uh, until here and then you join uh, you join the front piece and the back piece together and you just knit uh, knit in one large piece front and back and I would say that is the most difficult or most boring part of this project is you have to knit one uh, knit two hundred stitches and then purl two hundred stitches, and the purling two hundred stitches in a row. Uh, it's just kind of too much for me. It's a bit boring. <laughs> it gets a bit boring. Uh, anyway, oh, after after that, uh, you uh, pick up stitches around the armhole and uh, knit knit in the round while decreasing stitches and then you finish the armpit and then finally you do the button band and and then you also knit small pieces for the pocket and then you sew them around and I, I do like the pocket a lot because I'm going to wear this as a jacket for spring I do like this color um, it's just reminds me of some like lilac lavender flowers in the spring um, and I like the pockets because I have to put my wallet and my phone in it. Yeah, so I, yeah, I, I always need some pockets for my jackets when I go out. Um, I made one 
big mistake <laughs> when I was doing this, and I'd like to share this so that when other beginners are trying to do that, they don't <laughs> have the same mistake. Uh, the mistake was so I I knitted the back piece right, and then I and I was supposed to pick up some stitches and knit the front piece, and the instruction calls for uh, picking up let's say picking up thirty four stitches from the back back piece and then knit the front piece, and I counted that on this edge there are sixty eight stitches, and I think. Oh well, I'm supposed to pick up 34 stitches out of, out of 68 stitches. Then I should pick one stitches, uh, also one stitches uh, every two stitches, and I, <laughs> I I did that, and I knitted for a while, and I realized the the back p after I knitted like about this much of the front piece, I just found the back piece was all crinkled up. Uh, and I was just trying to figure out why, and then I realized that I'm not supposed to pick one stitches um, every two stitches. I should just pick up the one stitch, one another. Uh, I should just pick up stitch stitches continuously without jumping any stitches because the first thirty four stitches is for me to link the front piece. And the rest of the 34 stitches are to, for the armhole. So the, the other 34 stitches are supposed to be picked up uh, supposed to be picked up later to make the armhole. And uh, so I had to uh, unravel all the front pieces I make and then pick up the stitches again. So yeah, so just when you're trying to pick up stitches it's better to have a big picture of what you're trying to do for the whole garment and how the con construction works before you <laughs> uh, get think think yourself is very clever and you did, did some and did did something actually was wrong. So yeah, so that was uh, one mistake from me. Hope you don't make mistakes like me when you're knitting some cardigan like this and pick up, always pick up the correct stitches. Um, okay, so that's for this first finished object. Um, the second one I want to show is a small scarf I had. And this is the seaweed scarf. Uh, the pattern from this is uh, it's from it's it's from a Japanese knitting book again. As you can see, I have a thing for Japanese knitting books, and today I'm actually going to share another uh, Japanese knitting book translated to Chinese. Anyway, and uh, and last time I also showed a lot of patterns, uh, a lot of uh, finished objects from Japanese knitting books. I do find the Japanese knitting knitting style is. Uh, quite cute and and quite different from I would say the Western uh, knitting things. Um, and I the thing I like most about the Japanese knitting book is they always have some good schematic and some uh, charts. And I usually prefer reading charts and schematics than just reading uh, row by row uh, patterns. Because uh, if I'm reading schematics, then I have a good uh, overall picture of the project, so that like I wouldn't make any mistake like when I did for this when I'm picking up the wrong stitches. Uh, and also, uh, as an engineer myself, I just would prefer to know the construction of the thing before I actually work on the little details. I just feel it's always good to have a good engineering view of the whole thing. And that's kind of what I love about knitting, right? Um, because it allows you for some creative, do some creative things as well as doing some engineering things and like being creative and uh, being an engineer is just two of my main thing. And now put them together, I got knitting and I also got cozy uh, variable results from that, so I think that's why I'm so stoked about knitting right now. 
anyway, back to the scarf. Uh, uh, I will link the book, uh, the Japanese knitting book, below as usual. Um, so the I I got this. I got a beautiful green yarn from my grandma. And um, it's where is it? I got about one hundred grams of it, and and. At that time, I just saw that seaweed pattern, and I think it's really, really perfect for uh, the spring. And that, and this design was by the Japanese designer called Yuko Hata, and she is uh, quite versatile. She designs a lot of different things like fur um iron sweaters, and like easier accessories like this. And she's also doing a lot of uh, crochet patterns. Um, you can check out her Ravelry, there's a huge amount of patterns and she also publishes some uh, part pattern in English as well. So yeah, so if you're interested, you can check that out. Um, this scarf is quite easy. So I'm not, I guess I'm not allowed to show the pattern here, but I can just quickly explain because this is very easy and I think a sophisticated knitter would just be able to see what I'm doing here just by by looking at the end result. So you actually you begin by casting on like ten stitches or so, and the both edges they are just some uh, rolled edges without any special treatment. It's just there are four stuck uh, four stitches of stuck net at each side. And in the middle, this is just the seed stitch or moss stitch if you are British, I guess. And by seed stitch, it means just you have one knit, one purl, one knit, one purl. And on the other side, uh, you knit the purl stitch, you purl the knit stitch. So the knit and purl are reversed and, and you're just alternating uh, knit and purl stitch when you are building up on uh, more rows. And to create this diamond kind of shape, you are increasing one stitches every two rows. Yeah, uh, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think so. You s increase one stitch on each side every two row, and you increase that until the width you would like. And then after that point, you are decreasing one stitch on each side every two rows until you uh, re uh, decrease that until it only has 10 stitches and then you increase again, uh, you decrease again and then you just keep going and until the length you want. Uh, the original patterns calls for 11 pattern repeat but uh, I just had some extra yarn from my grandma. I, I wanted to use them all so I did 12 of these diamonds and it was a very easy quick knit. I think beginners should be able to do this. Uh, if, I mean if you know how to in increase, how to decrease, how to uh, knit and pearl. I'm, I'm not sure how like, adventurous beginner or uh, advanced beginner could pull out this project. Uh, and I, I did this just over the weekend. Uh, I think I'm, I'm really I'm really happy with it and this color this green color is just one of my favorite shades of green and it goes really well with the spring weather um, so I'm quite happy with this piece of accessory that I brought and I only had this much leftover yarn from my grandma so of, of this color I still have many other yarns from my grandma as well so uh, I'm happy quite happy with uh, using up this yarn by doing this project. Um, another finished object is uh, again a piece of accessory. This is uh, let's see, a cabled hat uh, from a pattern book that I'm about to show you next. And um, this this is one of the most complicated uh, cables that I have done. Um, as you can see, it has uh, three different types of cables. The one is this cable, the other is like this, uh, 
reversed V-shaped cable and the other is this zigzag shaped cable and I I was just trying to uh, use use up a lot of my grandma's yarn so I so I finished using this yarn and then I changed to another white colored yarn and then when I knitted to about here this yarn used up uh, and then I was using another uh, another type of yarn and that yarn used up and then I changed another color of yarn and well that that color didn't use up but I, I finished the hat <laughs> as I said last time my grandma uh, she, she gave me a, a lot of yarns with different colors but each type of yarn there's only a few amount or like a medium amount of them and I just have to either combine them or just use them up one by one like in this script, uh, scrappy scrappy project uh, but I, I, I do like how this turned out and they, the different colors they well is there these are just different shades of white so they aren't drastically different so I guess it's okay and I do like this color for the spring it's not so uh, so dark, it's for winter, so I, I guess it's a good good hat for the, for the spring. And I do want a hat with this sharp kind of tip at the point, so I think this is the perfect project for me. And the book, that uh, the pattern that I got for that hat is from this book, uh, The Daily Hand Knitting. Um, this is of uh, so this is a book from the Japanese publishing house called Japan uh, Japan Vogue, and uh, Japan Vogue is an I think it's a quite famous publishing house at least in Japan or in East Asia, and they just feature a lot of uh, knitting patterns, crocheting, and handcrafting, sewing, like fiber arts kind of. Uh, patterns and knowledges. They, pu they publish a lot of books from that. And I think the Chinese knitting community is closer to the Japanese knitting community. So uh, in China, we, we have a lot of translated version from uh, some from these Japanese knitting books. Well, I do hope there are more English version uh, from these beautiful, beautiful Japanese knitting books. And I, if someone from you know uh, uh, like any publisher here who's interested in translating uh, from these Japanese knitting books, uh, let me know. I would definitely be happy to do some translation uh, for, the, uh, for them. And I'm going to insert a video of me flipping through that, this book for you here. Okay, let's flip this daily hand knitting by Japanese Vogue. Here's the contents. Um, the Japanese knitting books are always organized by some beautiful photographs at the beginning and then the pattern book at the back. The first one is a cute polar bear uh, mitten and you can even see the paws here. Your thumb is the <laughs> your thumb is the paw of the polar bear. And some Nordic patterned mittens and Nordic patterned cap. A nice fair L project. And there is a Raglan uh, sleeved uh, Aaron patterned sweater. This is the only sweater in this book. And next is uh, some drop shaped pattern cap. I tried to make this for my mom, but I messed up the gauge and then end up with a huge cap. So I had to do some aggressive decrease later on. And here is another lacy patterned scarf and some colorful mitten and a round yoke cape. Uh, and again, another easy, I think, an easy color work project. And this is with some stitch work embroidery mittens. So you knit the uh, plain colored mitten first and then you stitch these uh, bird pattern and flowers afterwards. Um, this is the uh, sharp tip cap that I made. Here the Tongali 
uh, means a sharp tipped point in Japanese. And I, I made a white color instead of this yellow color. Uh, here is another Aran color half. Oh, and this one was made with four millimeter needle and DK weight yarn. And this one is made with bulky yarn with a 5.5 millimeter needle. I made this one for my grandma. I'll perhaps insert a picture here. Uh, here again, an Aran patterned socks. I intend to make these um, sometime later, maybe in winter. And some Fair L uh, cap. These are made with, I think, Jimison's uh, Spindrift yarn and you have many different color options. Another shawl or cape. And you have many different ways to wear it, like uh, indicated here. And some color work socks with diamond shape patterns. And an uh, arrow shaped uh, cape. Again, you have many options to wear it. Some nice cabling, isn't it? And this is cute. This is a little fox shaped uh, scarf. And there's some, uh, I think, seed stitch in the belly and some color work at the front and with the little ears. And my grandma gave me this yarn, this orange colored yarn. I think this will be perfect for making these maybe later in autumn or winter. I'll definitely make this one. And here's another uh, color work cap and mitten. These are for children, but you can easily adapt that to adult size just by adding perhaps an extra uh, pattern repeat. And a small flowers mitten for children. Again, easily adaptable. And in, in, in the Japanese uh, books, you usually have the patterns like this the graphs and then some details for like how to do the thumb I think I'll just quickly flip through uh, so the front part are colored and at the back you have the pattern books um, so you are this is how a Japanese sweater pattern looks like you just have the schematics and then you have the charts for how to how to do the cables and that's all <laughs> so I, I don't think i should give too much detail about these here and at the back you have the contents for all these pieces in the book so far i've been working really really hard on this purple cardigan number eight uh, and for the new work in progress, there aren't really much. There are just a few swatches. So one project I wanted to do is, so here's another Japanese knitting book called Fair L Knitting. I'll, I'll show you this maybe next time. And in this book, I found this really, really cute uh, green cardigan. And in my grandma's yarn, I happen to have a bunch of green yarn. It's a like a darker, maybe sage colored green um, that I have. I, I will have enough of this yarn to make the main color for the cardigan. And also um, in the past week, I was doing some uh, teaching assistant, a uh, lab supervision work for undergrads, and there were just some free time when I uh, don't have anything to do while waiting for new students coming. Uh, so I just wanted to have some projects that can give me some mindless knitting, uh, and I don't, uh, some project that I don't need to carry a pattern with me. And for this project, uh, it calls for uh, knitting from bottom up and you basically cast on some number of stitches and knit uh, bottom up for the front piece front piece and back piece and you put them together and then you knit the the uh, sleeves and i think well this front piece is just a block of stock net stitch and it's perfect for uh, carrying some small project and doing some manless knitting 
Um, I just couldn't bring this whole jacket to school, right? That's just too much. Uh, so yeah, so this is how much I've been working. Uh, I had through one week. Uh, this is just one front piece. And one thing interesting what I'm trying to do is that my, my gauge is very different from that, from the book. Um, I'm, I'm glad that I did a swatch before actually doing the project. Here is my little swatch. And I found that uh, the, the book used three millimeter needle and they achieved uh, 26.5 stitches uh, per 10 centimeters gauge and when I'm using three millimeter needles and my gauge was way off and it was very loose the bottom one is the three millimeter and then for the second half of the swatch I changed to 2.5 millimeter needle and then I achieved the same gauge as uh, indicated in the book so I don't know if it's because of the yarn. The original book uh, calls for the Jamison Spindrift, Jamison and Smith Spindrift, Jamison Spindrift yarn, and oh, I don't have that yarn, so I I don't know how different that is from my grandma's green yarn. So well, that that could all be a factor, and maybe the designer they have she has a different gauge, so. I changed to reduce to 2.5 millimeter needle and the top part looks much better, much smoother to me. So, uh, and to mark the difference, I used, uh, let's see, for the bottom, the three millimeter, I just have three uh, pearl bumps. And for the top, 2.5 millimeter needle, I used uh, two pearl stitches and then a blank and then uh, five uh, pearl stitches uh, to, to just to mark the different size and I learned I learned this technique from Inga from knitting traditions I think that's a quite a good way to remind yourself which uh, size of needle that you have used so that's one project I worked on uh, another project, I, I wanted to make a vest for my mom uh, because she wanted a vest <laughs> and I happen to have uh, another bunch of yarn from my grandma. This is like a coffee colored, very thin, like perhaps a light fingering weight, a wool yarn it feels like and I think that will be enough to make a vest. Uh, the pattern I found was uh, the sail or silly, I don't know how to pronounce that, the sail vest from Petite Knit. It features some uh, just some uh, simple uh, like zigzag shape uh, made through the knit and pearl stitches um, and uh, perhaps put a picture here and my mom wanted a v-neck instead of a round neck at like the original design so I'll have to think about how to pull that up when I'm doing the project and I have my swatches here <coughs> and again I had some problem with the gauge so on the bottom part, you can see, perhaps, yeah. On the bottom part, I was using the four millimeter, the four millimeter needle required from the pattern. And my gauge was huge. So I changed that to 3.5 millimeter needle and I achieved the gauge uh, required for the pattern. So I don't know, maybe, maybe it's just my knitting was really loose. So the way I try to uh, make my gauge uniform is like when I'm like when I'm knitting, I would feel like how slippery my stitches is, and I usually I I I, I think I do keep it kind of loose. And usually when if I'm like I'm able to move it around like this, then it's my euro gauge, and perhaps that's kind of a bit loose for compared to most other people. So I might need to reduce a needle size when I'm trying to use patterns. The one last thing I'm, tr uh, I'm working on is not a knitting thing, it's a designing thing. 
Um, so uh, a friend of mine is having her birthday in the start of May, and she lives in Alberta, so a very cold place in Canada, up in the north. And I wanted to knit her a pair of mittens, and she specified she wants fingerless mittens. And the color that she likes are uh, red, black, like warm, earthy kind of tones. And I have this beautiful, let's see if you, this beautiful wine colored uh, yarn from my grandma. It the camera doesn't really show it's. It's a it's a dark wine color, but it also has like lighter red uh, shimmers in it. It's quite a beautiful uh, yarn. It's, it looks like it's a DK weight, and I'm I'm trying to design something. And I asked her what kind of motif she likes, and she said she likes uh, fox. And I wanted to do some fur L designing. And I was designing it in my uh, Switch game, Animal Crossing. As I said last time, there is a designing tool in the Animal Crossing game. And in the game, let's see if you can see. In the game, you can uh, draw this kind of pixel art uh, with their designing tool. And Oh, I don't know if you can see a fox from it. So that's the fox face and the tip of the nose. And it's kind of an abstract fox. Um, because initially I wanted to try to draw like a, a regular fox, but with all the constraints of doing fair L, uh, like you have, you only have two colors in a row and you have to have some certain color contrast and you don't want your flows to be too long with all of that uh, i kind of gave up the idea of designing a regular fox so i i, w I went to some abstract di direction of the of of uh, plotting and i came up with this so i'm going to try to knit this uh, in the next week and see how it goes and finally the plans I have one more plan for knitting next week is to do the scarf number one by my favorite knitwear oh, my favorite knit design the same designer from this cardigan and there is like a simple lacy uh, lacy design of a, like a triangular small scarf where you can just wrap around your neck. Uh, I, I saw um, Talia from the Afterthought broadcast, uh, podcast. Uh, she's also kind of a beginner and the scarf was one of the first uh, like lacy project that she did. And I, uh, I, I, I'd like to do that as well just for the spring because now I, it's just not a time for heavier scarves anymore. Yeah. So that's all my knitting plans and knitting adventures from the past two weeks. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Uh, at the back of the episode, I will put in uh, some footage from uh, the Wet Coast Wool, the local yarn shop that I went a lot. And that's also where I learned knitting. So I put a footage of that cute, cute shop, and they uh, they feature some the host garn yarn that um, um, I knitted with, and also I'll put some footage of some cherry blossom just uh, down below the down below my balcony. Uh, yeah, there's cherry blossom in Vancouver these days. They're so beautiful, uh, and also I'll. Uh, combine combine that with some of my uh, some of my piano playing there. Um, well, I hope you like this episode. Um, I'm on Instagram as sd underline Athena. I'm on Ravelry as Athena Liu. And um, leave a comment in below what you are knitting on. Uh, I'd like to hear about uh, how people are doing with their knitting. Um, well, in the meanwhile, uh, take care of yourself, uh, don't stress out on knitting, and knit with healthy styles, um, and 
um, yeah, in happy happy knitting, and bye. See you next time.